Okay, all right. Well, look, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm here from Dublin Coding School to talk to you about a career in tech and where do I begin. Um, I'm also going to be here for a short time afterwards in the career clinic outside. So if you did want to have a chat, we can sit down right after this. I won't be here in the afternoon. So if you did want to chat, uh, that's when I'll be here. Um, so a quick one about me. So I'm the, the general manager of Dublin Coding School. Um, I have an MBA from Imperial College. I studied AI um, at MIT and um, also digital marketing at Oxford. But, and that's Molly, my daughter there, who's a bit bigger now, but not much bigger. Um, so who are Dublin Coding School? We're a tech education provider. Um, and what we're really doing is training adults in career change to an entry level. So we're for beginners. You don't need any prior experience or knowledge to come to us. We're not really training you to be Steve Jobs. We're training you to be you know, Steve Jobs as intern or as entry level person. Um, so that, that's kind of who we are. We're, we're, we're in Ireland, obviously, um, but we're also in Riga, um, Vilnius in Lithuania, and we have a coding school in Prague now. That's the latest one. And we're training people in those countries too. Um, and we've had 7,000 graduates so far. Um, right, but the presentation is going to be about, right, where do I begin? So you haven't worked in tech, you don't know where, where to start. Um, and the idea behind this will be to show you some of the roles and what they actually do. So to de demystify it a bit. Because people always say, oh, I want to get a job in Google. But then behind the wall, what are they actually doing in there, right? And what are the jobs? So I'm going to talk through each one, maybe. And who knows, you might think that one sounds like the one for me and I want to explore it. So that's kind of the idea here. Now, people ring the school all the time and say, I want to learn IT. And they email in, I want to learn about computers. And then we always say, well, which one? They just say, well, IT, computers. And that's a real common thing. But it, that's very much like saying, I want to play sport, then we have to figure out which sport is good for you, OK? Um, because each role in tech mightn't suit everybody for various reasons. Someone might be really good at snooker because of their hand-eye coordination. If someone really big and strong comes in, you go, maybe rugby's the one for you. So you kind of tried to did the area that might suit you better. And then it could be down to your personality type. Are you creative or are you analytical? You know, are you really motivated, determined? It depends what kind of area. Are you inquisitive? All of these different personality types can lead you down a different role in tech. Because it's a bit like when, you know, when they say um, you give your daughter a puppy for Christmas. You have to say that's not just for Christmas, it's for life, okay? It's the same with a course. If you think you're going to do a two or three, four week course and then you're going to kind of have a career in that area, you have to sort of think, no, this is 10 years of constant learning in this area. So you better be drawn to it, you better like it, or you're going to hate it, and you're going to quit. So really make up your mind which area you're, you're more drawn to. And we're going to talk about them here. And you'll probably get an inkling by listening which one you like, or maybe you don't like any of them, and that's also a sign. So to figure out what the jobs are first, we're going to look at how these tech companies are organized. Okay, This is in general terms. So obviously, they have sales, marketing, and what they now call customer success, which is just really helping their customers use their products. And they're kind of part of the marketing team, but not quite. So I'm not going to talk about those jobs, but obviously, there are good jobs there. And if you've studied, the reason I mention them, if you've studied some area in tech, sometimes you can land a sales or marketing role on the back of that. I know that people who've done our cybersecurity course sometimes get jobs in sales in cybersecurity because they want people who know what they're talking about. So that's just something to bear in mind. Another route into these companies is IT, customer support. We get a lot of students coming from these areas. Um, you kind of learn your way around the company there. And um, you know they're not bad jobs. And you'll get a feel for what all the departments are. And then we do get quite a few people coming from IT support, maybe doing things like data analytics to upskill and then internally trying to move departments. So that's, that's a way people move around too. But let's have a look at the tech departments, which is what we're here to talk about today. Okay? So I'm going to talk about these general areas, UX, UI, design, web development, uh, quality assurance or testing, data analytics, or cybersecurity. Now, don't worry if you don't know what they all mean. I'm going to explain them to you uh, in, in, in different ways. First of all, if we look here, if you, if you think about the construction industry, which I think is one most people can understand, your UX, UI designers, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, are a bit like your architects. Okay? They're putting down the blueprint. They're creating the design. But how many architects have actually picked up a brick <laughs> and put mortar on it? Not many. They pass those designs over to the web developers, in this sense, or the builders, and then they build it. Okay? But how many builders know if a building will really stand up or fall over? Not many. So they call in the structural engineers, who then will talk about the foundations, 
why these pillars are here or whatever to keep the thing standing up. And the quantity surveyors pulling all of the data. And then cybersecurity are a bit like the security guards keeping it safe, okay? That's really what they're doing. We're going to talk, see, cybersecurity can be a bit more than that, but we're going to talk. Physical security does come into it, though, and we'll talk about that. So let's look at this in terms of Amazon's website, right? So um, first of all, we all use this website quite a lot. There's a lot going on here. First of all, it needs to be designed, doesn't it? So the, the original layout has to be designed. Um, and the, a lot more goes into the design than you might think, which I'll get to. I don't want to use up all my material on this slide. <laughs> it then needs to be built, OK? So they hand it over. It needs to be tested. So if you're on the Amazon website and you find a button that doesn't work, that means the tester hasn't found a flaw and passed it back to the designers to redesign it. So that's, that's what the testers are doing. Results need to be analyzed. So you know, they're, Be Bezos will always want to know, what's my top selling item in, in Connecticut? What's my top selling item in you know, North Dublin near Croke Park right now? And his data analysts can pull that and say, there it is, sir. He'll go, right, OK, put that to the top of the website, please, or let's give a discount on that. So they're constantly analyzing how you're using the website. And it needs to be protected. What needs to be protected? Data. So cybersecurity are always just, it's about protecting data physically and digitally. With Amazon's case, really, it's credit cards. His big risk is your credit card getting loose and then you kind of saying to them, well, what, what happened there? And him being liable. So these are the departments, and they are broken up into departments that do all of this. Um, and I'm going to get into each one and what they actually do in a moment. Uh, but just before I do, we'll look at the banking sector, um, which has gone through a lot of change, OK? So if you look, this is about um, what digital jobs, how these jobs might have changed, OK? So in the past, so I was growing up in the 80s, maybe, in the early 90s, and um, if I wanted to go to the bank then or whoever, I'd have, I'd have to not go at lunchtime because they used to lock the door. You'd have to knock. You couldn't get in. At 4 o'clock, they all shut down. They're not open on the weekend. You can't get money out in anything like that. ATMs were a new thing then that came in, but then that's physical money. But now look at it. You have to use an app. Okay? When I was a teenager, we didn't even have a phone that could have an app. But now it's ubiquitous. Everything has an app. Um, you're transferring money around. On, on these apps, all of that kind of thing. But that change happened really quickly. So then the banks had to suddenly say, well, we need new staff who can do this. Um, so if you look at this, this is actually one of the first banks, um, Wells Fargo, in the old Wild West. So what, what do you think was on their CV? It's probably, can you shoot a gun? You know, Are you strong? Or can you ride a horse? Can you count? And you know, that would have been what someone, and, and to be honest, that didn't change right up until the 80s, maybe not in certain countries fire a gun. Um, but nowadays, it's data, right? It's cybersecurity. Bank of Ireland actually hire the most amount of data analysts in the country right now. They have a massive team. We have three of them as our lecturers, and they're just constantly analyzing everything. One example of what they do is they're always looking at which ATMs are being used the most around the country, and that informs them where they need to move physical cash or not and exactly what day they need to refill it. Uh, they might notice one area down the country when pensions are paid, that all the 60-year-olds in the town empty out these certain ATMs, so they have to have cash ready for them. That was something they told us. Or other ones aren't used at all, so they only keep them a quarter full in case they're robbed. So they're always analyzing everything all the time. So there's great jobs there in that. If you look at this app, okay, the Bank of Ireland app, which we all use, we've got the guy who did the UX UI design of this as our lecturer, uh, Steve Coleman. So this had to be designed, right? Um, but also, when he was designing it, he had to think, how would a 70-year-old use this app? So he had to check with, seven, with, with loads of them to check how they were using it. He didn't come up with the code. The cybersecurity team had to tell him, this is the security check. But he had to design it. Then he had to give it to a web developer who had to build it. Then the data analysts had to analyze it. They could tell him, where are people actually clicking on this? Where does it fall down? And then they'd feed that back. So as I said here, all these different departments interact um, to, to come up with these apps. So, uh, that's, so we're going to move on very now. UX designers, so what do they actually do? So this is one actually, this department, it's where it starts. So user experience, that's about checking out how customers are interacting with your product. So that the Bank of Ireland app, if you found that five out of 10 people were putting in their code wrong three or four times, it's not their problem, it's yours because that's way too high, so the design is wrong. What color should it be? They're testing it with thousands of people. 
uh, how do older, younger people use it? And this is across all websites. The user experience, user interface designers, that's what they're doing. It's a kind of a process called design thinking, they call it, where you start with the problem and then you work back and design the product of the problem. Uh, it's how the iPhone was made. This job doesn't actually involve coding. It's more about testing with people. If you're, if you're going to have a job in this area, you need to be empathetic. You need to think about the world through other people's eyes, lots of different types of profiles of people, and come up with designs that, that will fit them, them for the most part. Uh, you need sort of high emotional intelligence and maybe good communication skills and be creative. So if that's you, maybe you should look into UX design. A lot of people ring up, well, what course can I do that there's no coding in it? And I go, well, are you on the creative side? No. I go, okay, there's none then. <laughs> but, or, but if you are, it's this one, okay? Then we move on. And this is also if you're creative too, okay? The web developers, but also like building things. Um, we do find some people learning UX design and web development because they do complement that a startup might want someone who can design it and build it. But in your bigger companies, there'll be two different departments, okay? And UX design is its own discipline. But the web developers, this is where you're learning coding. Okay, and it obviously gets more complex as you go. I've highlighted some coding languages there, which won't mean anything to anyone really <laughs> if, if you don't know coding. But if, if you look, it, don't be scared of them. They are understandable. I'm not a coder, and even I understand them now. But if you think about it, HTML are the building blocks of a website. So that's just your, your basic framework. CSS is the decoration, the coloring, all the bells and whistles that you might put on. And then JavaScript is its nervous system. So if you say on the Amazon website, click on a red jumper you want to buy at Christmas, they say the JavaScript code will say, oh, someone's clicked on the red jumper. What are the next things we need to do? We need to put the number one up in his cart. <laughs> we need to change that to a bit of gray. We need to shoot a message to our database saying that that's, that's, that's gone in there. And then whatever's next, or if you click on next page, the JavaScript will say, oh, change the page quickly. So it's worked out, it's basically what are the next steps the website does based on your actions at a very basic level. And then PHP is your back end when you're building a, a database at the back of the website. So that's what a web developer does. They'll take the designs that they've been given by the UX side and they'll start building, building the blocks here. So if you're into tech, into building things, and on the creative side, web development can be a good area for you. Um, it's, it's also an area where people might go in as a starting point because once you study this, your knowledge will go up and you'll know which way you want to go and which way you don't want to go, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's probably the most um, attractive area to most beginners. Um, now, here, here's what I call um, a hidden gem okay, as a career. Not many people want to go into testing straight away. Okay? It's, it's a bit like if, you, if, if you've ever played football. Sorry if it's a to the ladies, but if it's a boring example to some people, but not everyone wants to be the goalkeeper <laughs> when, when, the, when, the, when like the eight-year-olds go into it. They all want to score a goal, but the ones that do want to be the goalkeeper have a very good chance of being the goalkeeper if, if there's only a couple of them because there's less competition, and that's a bit like testing, okay? So, so when these kind of UX designers and flair players, if you like, the web developers have built something, this team have to go and check it for flaws. You know when a new computer game goes out? No, I don't play them, but within 30 seconds online, all the flaws are on YouTube. Look, we found out this, this problem, because the QA team didn't find them. And there's a good cup, bad cup relationship maybe between the web developers and the testers, where they'll say, look, I've built this beautiful website, what do you think? And they'll come back going, yeah, 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 big mistake here, look, we found one. <laughs> but what about the, yeah, the rest was okay, but it's a big mistake. So they have to go back, maybe give it to the designers to redesign it, because whatever they found, it's a design flaw too. Then they have to redesign it again, build it again, and hand it back to the testers. And there's two types of testers. You can be a manual tester, which in layman's terms is where you go and check for one thing yourself, write a bit of code and check for that. Or an automation tester, where you write a program that will go away and test thousands of things. Sometimes they leave them running overnight and come back and tell you what, what went wrong. And then you can, you can diagnose that and send it back to the other team. And there's a whole career in this, right? This goes from being a tester in automation, a senior, to being the head of the QA department. Um, and as I said, just a little tip, it, there can be sometimes less competition here than your web developing department. It's the goalkeeper striker thing example. Um, I'll move on. Now, data analytics, another great area. And as I mentioned, this one is hot right now for jobs, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. 
But th there are a lot of jobs for data analysts out there at the moment. There's probably more jobs than data analysts if you get into it. And, and what they do from a technical point of view is they're extracting data from databases, they're turning it into images, and sort of presenting it back to decision makers. That's at a, at a, at a basic level. If you've ever seen a, a, on the news, right, a pie chart or some graphs saying, oh, today, you know, this happened and here's the statistics around that. Um, a data analyst has done that. They've pulled that data, turned it into those images, given it to the weatherman to use or whoever it might be. So that's what SQL is, by the way. It just pulls data from a database or various databases. Um, Tableau, Power BI is another system that can turn it into images. Data analytics, as you get into it and get more and more advanced, does lead to machine learning and AI. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, um, data analytics would be the place to start. And you look, the coding language favored by them is Python. So just be aware that that's that if you wanted to get into AI, which is obviously um, very buzzy right now, um, data analytics would be the place to start that. Now, cybersecurity. And we've got a great guy leading the next two or three of these, um, Dr. Bunic from Croatia, but he's actually the cybersecurity director at Nestle, and he's our lecturer. He's leading the next couple of these. Now, cybersecurity is, um, if you think it's going to be like James Bond, <laughs> it isn't. So just be aware that these jobs sometimes are a little bit less boring than that, more boring than that. But um, it, it is a real fun area. You get into cryptography, uh, penetration testing, and ethical hacking, where you pretend to be the bad guys and hack your own systems to find the, the areas. Uh, network security. Physical security does come into this, by the way, um, which, which is quite, quite an interesting one. I know that um, some cybersecurity managers will send maybe emails to all their staff trying to catch them out, and then two weeks later say, oh, look, you all, who responded to that email? We would have been hacked if you, you clicked on that, and it was their own one. Um, but the physical security thing is interesting. Like, it was years ago um, when, I think it was the, the, uh, the Americans got into the Iranian uh, nuclear plant with their worm. And the, but they, they actually got a USB stick inside and into one of the computers. And supposedly the way they did it was they threw it over the wall and it had um, director salaries written on it. And it was just too much for someone. And they just saw it and went, what's that like? You know, stuck it in. And once it was in, once it was done. But the whole game was we have to get physically inside. How do we do it? And so physical security, so cybersecurity director there had to say, how do we keep foreign USBs out of all our machines first. That's the first ring. Then the next thing is actually inside. It's digital is the protection. So um, there's a, a video on YouTube with Sarah Jane Madden, who's a cybersecurity director, who's our course advisor. Um, you can probably find us Dublin Coding School on YouTube. But she gives a great presentation, actually, about the different rings of cybersecurity. And the first one she talks about is physical. And she's a cybersecurity director here in Dublin. So it's just it's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, for those of us who wanted to be a detective or that type of thing, and if you <laughs> this is the closest you'll get to it in the tech world. Now, oh, prop tech, I'll move on from that because, um, right, that was for uh, maybe not relevant to here. So which one are you drawn to? Okay, so you have to sort of think which one of those, as I said, because it's not just for about doing a course or a degree for a few years. You're always going to be learning in tech because things change all the time. So you have to be open to saying, Look, I'm really interested in this area. I'm going to keep learning throughout my career in this. Um, a couple of sort of insider tips. I have found in cybersecurity, it's really hard to get your first job, your entry-level job. But then after that, it seems easier to get promoted. <laughs> okay, so the, the, at, at the top end and the mid end of cybersecurity, there's a real drought and people get promoted quite quickly if they go in and do well. But finding an internship can sometimes be harder than finding a manager role for someone with a few bit of experience in cyber. Data analytics, again, it's easier to find your first job. But then once you're in, maybe slower to get promoted. So there's a few things like that, but I'll be here at the clinic to talk about when you're making a choice. But again, the, the, I do think those things shouldn't um, influence your choice as much as which one you're actually drawn to and motivated to do. Um, and pe people always ask, well, which one pays more? You know? um, to be honest, they all pay well if you're motivated to do them. So if one of them has you know, a little bit more starting salary as an entry-level person than the other one, don't pick it because of that. Because you're going to go in and you're not going to like it. And you're going to, the one you do like, you're going to do better at and you're going to progress more and it'll all even out. So don't, don't, don't let money be a factor. Let the motivation to which one you like best uh, be the one. Now, what should you do S to start out? Okay, learn basic skills and start at the beginning. That's the thing. Don't get overawed. Don't start looking at loads of videos that senior web developers do. Just say, I'm going to learn the basics and take it step by step, okay? 
Obviously, we'd love you to choose us, but this is just general advice wherever you go. Just start with the beginning. Build a technical portfolio, okay? So for most of these roles, you're going to go in. It's a bit like going when you're applying for art college. They look at your CV, but what they really want to see is can you paint or draw, okay? So they're going to look at your portfolio. So if you're going for a web developer job, they want you to have two or three websites you've built based off what you've learned, and then they can see it and check out what, what you're doing. And they might even give you a technical test, okay? For UX, UI designers, this is absolutely key. They live by their portfolio, okay? It should be online, websites everywhere. It should be on your CV. It's what they're going to look at. Um, and you can even have a portfolio for other roles like data analytics. You could take a data set, turn it into images using something, and say, I've solved this business problem using this, and they, they can see what you've done um, with these databases. So you can have a portfolio in all of them, but it's always good to do that. Uh, and, and, and get someone to look at your portfolio who's a pro to sort of give feedback. Don't just think. Obviously, if you've done it in a college, it'll be good too. Prepare for technical questions. These are different types of interviews sometimes. So you do need to, um, and there, you can use the STAR method, which I'm not going to get into now, I don't have time, but um, you do want to have some technical answers ready for technical questions too. And there's, there are free online resources that have 20 free questions for entry-level staff in all areas of tech. So you can find those, or I can tell you them after this talk. And build a network. I know someone's going to talk about this later, but what you should do, say you say, I want to be a web developer, or I want to be a, actually, I had a, we had a student there who, she wants to get into cybersecurity. So actually, what we advise her to is she's going to reach out to 20 cybersecurity directors in Dublin and say, hi, my name is X, and really looking to get into cybersecurity. Can I have some career advice that looks like you're doing really well in the area, and that type of thing. She's not looking for a job of them or anything else, just advice. And what we're hoping for is after 20 of those calls, maybe one of these cybersecurity managers will say, hey, there's that open. Oh, that, that, there's a role just come up, I'll call them. And they might have heard about it otherwise. So they're just building a network, and they're trying to come across motivated and as a kind of a good up-and-comer um, and build that network. So I, I would advise everyone to do that once you know the area you want to be in. Quick one on the tech skills gap, just to show you that there is an opportunity here. So if you look at um, uh, so if you, data analytics, IBM um, have said that the ads for data analysts has gone up 28% in the last three years and it's third in the top 10 emerging jobs on LinkedIn. So that's just based off uh, LinkedIn itself. Then if you look at the European Commission, this von der Leyen um, has said there's 484,000 unfilled data analytics positions across Europe by 2025, which basically means there'll be ads for data analytics jobs, companies needing them, and not enough people to fill them across Europe. In Ireland, so this one's maybe just a year out of date up until last December, but uh, there's 146,000 of these jobs. And they're adding 8,000 um, annually, which they're actually adding way more than that. So there is a, a gap here in data analytics uh, in particular. What causes a gap? This, is a <laughs> this looks like a piece of DNA, okay? But actually, this is um, a little bit about uh, where a skills gap can come in. It's where the needs of tech companies moves above where the education system is. So th there's not enough people coming through. And one, once... Like something like AI comes out, and two years ago it was the Internet of Things, okay, where it was connected devices, where they'd say, we'll have a fridge here, and it's going to connect to the Internet, and we'll be able to refill that fridge, we'll know how many bottles are going out, okay? Two years ago, that was the big thing. Connected devices, connected everything. Suddenly this year it's artificial intelligence, and they turn around and go, forget about those connected devices, we need data analysts, and thousands of them. So, so they suddenly moved ahead, voomp, in their need for data analysts and people who could work in AI much quicker than people were being produced out of universities. And I'd say in three years, we can't predict what it will be, there'll be another thing. And they'll go, we need these types of people now. Where are they? Right? Because that's the way tech works. A new thing comes out, it's really hot, they need to fill it with staff, and bang. So um, we do have a skills gap at the moment. I think the AI one is pushing the data analyst thing, because that's where they feed in at the other level. But all the other jobs, obviously, can work in, in AI too. What's the solution? Well, I'd be a fool if I didn't say we're not a small part of it. Um, Dublin Coding School, but obviously we have competitors who you could go to too, but we think we serve a particular part of the market, which is all of our stuff is live, all of our lecturers are pros. Uh, so they're short and intensive. We only focus on jobs. So if we see a job being advertised, we'll create a course around it with the people doing the job. We don't have any kind of nice-to-do courses, and they're all live and interactive, and I'd say they're about 50% theory, 50% uh, practical. Who are they for? So it's adults um, who want to change their careers. 
usually beginners. Now, we can do advanced stuff. We'll do advanced stuff one-to-one -one and create something for you. But all of our off-the-shelf courses are for people who want to change careers. Um, and I'll give you some examples of people who've been through. So they're in the areas, really, we've talked about um, today. Um, our lecturers are from across the board, big brands, Bank of Ireland, TikTok, Facebook. Um, we have a Google guy now as well. Um, and Nestle, we have the cybersecurity director. <laughs> Hewlett Packard with the UX UI design lead. And then after the course, we'll help with your CV, your LinkedIn. Um, and we'll also share uh, CVs with our partner companies who might have open roles or internships. So if you have a look here, these are some of our partners. So Google have approved us for their apprenticeship program. If you've done the web development course, you can apply there. But we're a member of Scale Ireland, and we also provide interns to the startups in Trinity College uh, Tangent and Launchbox, and to these other companies too. So we're placing people all the time. Um, quite a good record placing junior developers as well. And here's a case study. So Svetlana actually came to our, um, she, she doesn't mind us using it as a case study, but we're really proud of this one. She came, she had um, a nail and beauty salon in Dublin, which shut down during COVID, came to do our data analytics course, really did well, got an internship through us at Tune Release, and then got a job at Accenture, and has since got a job at, is it Shearing Plow, the uh, pharmaceutical company. And in our CV clinic, actually, we said, she goes, what about, but I, I used to work in a pharmacy, should I put that in? We said, well, why don't we turn that into a strength? We won't say you were there selling products. We'll say you were there analyzing the pharma industry. <laughs> so then in the interview, they said, well, what do you know about the pharma industry? We know you've got a bit of data analytics. She goes, well, I know all the products, all the prices. Uh, I know all the brands. I know which ones are prescription, which aren't, which ones are used in hospitals, and which ones are available in pharmacy. They go, well, that's the first two months training. So you really have to look at, I suppose it's a different thing, because we do help people with CVs too. Try and turn your past into a, a strength. So if you've done data analytics, all of the jobs in the wrong industries, you've been analyzing them, and you can analyze them now. So that, that's the way you project forward as a career change. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. But uh, yeah, but that's what happened with Svetlana. She hit the home run and used her pharma experience to land a big pharma job as a data analyst. We have a second chance policy, OK? Now, this isn't because we fail everybody. But if you've done one of our courses once, you can repeat it for free within 12 months. Now, the reason for that is, do you remember when I mentioned portfolio? We want you to do, so if you're a web developer, we want you to do the project, get the certificate, and then repeat it in six months and do another project. Get it professionally graded, and you know you've got two projects for your portfolio. You feel comfortable going forward for interviews. Um, right, so that was kind of it. You can get hold of us at dublincoding.ie. I'm Luke, the general manager of set, so Luke at dublincoding.ie. We're on all the usual channels. Um, if you go to our YouTube, we have lots of interviews with lecturers and things. Uh, so that could be a nice place. But the team are very active on um, all these to get back to you. So I don't